Welcome to another edition of Gethsemane. We're so glad that you have joined us to study God's word and draw closer to God. Listen, don't just watch. Hit that like button. Subscribe. Be a participant in this Christian community. We have those who tune in every week into Gethsemane, and we pray that this blesses you as well. So go ahead and hit that like button. Let's get this message out to all four corners of the world. Also, we like to thank all of those who are supporters of this ministry. You don't just watch. You don't just subscribe. You don't just participate but you also support uh, this Christian platform so that we can be able to continue to share God's word. We want you to hit the link below. You can give your love offering, your donation. Thank you so much for supporting this ministry. I want to open up with a word of prayer and it will begin on today. Dear God and Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your care and we thank you for your word. Be with us on our study today that we may draw closer to you. In your wonderful and blessed name we pray. Amen. Bless it. So this is going to be a part two of our marriage, un, uh, a heartbroken and unhappy lesson that we did a few weeks ago. I've received so much feedback from people all over the world that um, were blessed by uh, the first lesson and wanted me to do a part two. And so there's some going to be some things that we discuss uh, in this that you don't necessarily have a venue or opportunity to discuss maybe at your local congregation. And so I would love to hear your thoughts. Thoughts. I would love to uh, know uh, some of your opinions or perspectives uh, and even our uh, understanding of, of what the word of God reveals to us. And so today we're going to look at Genesis chapter 29 and talking about marriage, talking about being heartbroken and talking about being uh, unhappy. And so one of the things that I realized about marriage is that marriage has many, it can have many different components that's connected to it, right? And so one of the things that is a, a constant that you can, that many times here in the church is you'll have uh, people quote the scripture, what God is joined together, let no man put asunder. In the 21st century, we have a lot of relationships that have come together and God didn't put them together. Um, there are a lot of our brothers and sisters that when they started dating, the last thing that was on their mind was God. Uh, there were a lot of Christians who uh, got into relationships uh, and they were not whole. Uh, they were not focused. Uh, they were not taught in the word of God. And so now they're in these relationships or they just decided one day we want to just go and get married. And they went and got married and they were so excited and they had this vision or idea of how marriage was going to be and how they were going to love because they watched the notebook and they wanted somebody just to love them for who they are. But they never studied the subject. Do you know how many married couples go into marriage, but they never study? They pull scriptures out. They say, yeah, the man is supposed to be the head but they never understood what that meant what does it mean for your husband to lead you um, and follow Christ and most women uh, a lot of women have picked husbands and they never ask the question how well do you follow Christ now if you don't follow Christ well there's a great possibility you can't lead me in the right way the Bible says that the uh, wife is a reflection of the church. But the woman that you married, you never um, you never investigated how she follows uh, Christ, how how uh, if she's even studied the church, she is supposed to be a reflection of the church. Um the husband is to, is supposed to be a reflection of Christ. And so you have these people that are in relationships and they, they don't understand their roles. I think that one of the main thing that they desire is I desire my image of love to be fulfilled. I have an image of what love is and I want it to be fulfilled. You got some people that are unhappy in godly relationships. 
And what I mean by that is you want your spouse to be a particular type of way, but your spouse is trying to be like Christ. Let me speak to the other uh, side of this coin. Your spouse is trying to be like Christ, but because you're not godly, you're unhappy. You have people in marriages that wish that their spouse was more carnal. He always praying. She always want to pray about, I don't want to pray. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, read any scripture. And you got your husband coming to you and said, but the word of God says, I, and she says, I don't want to hear about the Bible. And he's like, I don't know what to do because it's a great possibility. You didn't marry a godly woman. You didn't marry a godly man. Sometimes you got people that are unhappy in relationships because you got forced into that relationship. Your mama wanted you to marry him and your sister said, hey, he a good man. And your church members start looking at the clock and told you it was time. And you start feeling all of this external pressure and you never even investigated if you really loved him. Everybody was telling y'all that y'all look good together, but you never asked the question, do I want to even be with him? <laughs> and so sometimes you can be happy because you rushed in a marriage right after a heartbreak. You got your heart broken. And one of the things that you tried to do to recover from that relationship is you said, I'm going to get in a new relationship. And the relationship was going so well that uh, and this happens to a lot of individuals the relationship was going so well that he surprised you and said will you marry me and you were still healing from your past relationship and there was nothing wrong with your current relationship but you wasn't completely healed and so you said I do and this happens to men and women how many of you you said I do but you still missed your ex you still had thoughts. Now, people that are in love don't understand these scenarios that I'm bringing up and talking about because people that are in love and they're truly in love and it and it truly are allowing God to be in the relationship. They don't understand having a thought about another person or desiring uh, somebody of your past not being done with yesterday and you're still going back and forth. Do you know how many people come to the altar and they're still trying to make up in their mind, do I want to do this? Right. And so sometimes when you just forge ahead, which a lot of people have done because she got pregnant and you wanted to do right by her. So you propose and we're going to be a family, but maybe you are going to be a great father. But the reason why you're not a great husband is because you never loved her. And the reason why the marriage is not blossoming, because you said I do to a man you're not attracted to. And you thought the attraction would come later. And the only thing that uh, came later was love handles. Now you don't know what to do because ain't no love even. In, ain't enough love in the handles for you to even make the relationship work. <laughs> right. And so you have all of these dynamics of why. Um, relationships sometimes struggle in the beginning and then what ends up happening in the marriage is infidelity lies deceit hurt um, and sometimes because the foundation or the beginning wasn't right and so and, and then sometimes you're not happy because your spouse is not putting in the effort right so let's go a little bit deeper into that. Let's look at Genesis chapter 29. And I want you to look at this relationship. And we're going to pull some things out of this relationship that, and, and I'm going to say this as we get to the end. Some marital issues can be resolved if you improve your communication. That's one. Some marital uh, problems can be resolved if, um, you know, y'all haven't been on vacation, y'all don't spend time with one another, you've been too busy, you let the kids get involved and maybe y'all need to get back to just y'all and just connecting, you know, that's that Texas in me, that y'all. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you, you need to um, make more time for each other. Uh, you, you may need to work on, on adopting better tools. 
right? So sometimes when married couples have problems, they go to the church, they look for a word, they look for a scripture. Some couples go to counseling. Some couples try to go on vacation and re-spark the relationship. And sometimes those things work. This, this lesson is different. This lesson is different. This lesson is there are some relationships that you just can't solve by throwing a scripture at them. Are you telling them your experience and, and if they do what you did, then they'll get the same result. There are some marriages that are very complicated. They are complex and it takes a lot to unweave. Some relationships are hurting and you're struggling because the beginning wasn't right. And here's what the world doesn't understand. And here's what the world will not tell you. The world will tell you that you can break your vow with God because you're unhappy. That is not a message that I'm promoting. If you make a vow to God, you need to follow that vow. Right. Um, being unhappy is not a reason to get divorced. <laughs> Right. Being unhappy is not a be, because, um, you know, be, be, because you're tired of her hairstyle doesn't mean that you can go and get another wife. You got to answer to God for that. So let me just say that the world will tell you if you're not happy, just leave and, and go. They they don't honor. They don't honor God and they don't honor vows with God. Right. So that's not a message that I'm promoting. So the reason why sometimes in Christian marriages it's complex is because on one side of your marriage, you're trying to honor God. And then on the other side, you're dealing with maybe an individual or a person or even maybe yourself that's causing hurt, conflict and pain. And your your flesh says you can get rid of the pain, but in order to do it, you got to violate God. Sometimes that can be a very difficult thing. All right. So let's pull out some things and we'll, we'll, we'll read. We're in Genesis chapter 29 and we'll begin at verse 16. Genesis chapter 29 and we'll begin at verse uh, 16. And Laban had two daughters and the name of the elder was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was ugly. I mean, Le I'm sorry. Leah was tender eyed. But Rachel was beautiful and well favored. So if we just look at verse 17, verse 17 lets us know that b before we deal with a marriage or another within Leah's family dynamic, her little sister has more favor than her because of physical appearance. The Bible says that Rachel was beautiful. Leo was tender eyed. They do not look the same. Um, and so if if for a man to pursue Leia, um, you would may have to overlook some things or you would be pursuing her heart, ne not necessarily her shape or her face or her hair or whatever, because the Bible is letting us know that she physically does not have or, or is on the same level as Rachel. Now, let me say this. There are some women that say, and there are some men that say, physical appearance shouldn't matter. Okay, so I wanna let you know that is a lie from, from the devil. It matters, it matters. If that, if that wasn't true, then you would close your eyes and buy any house that has the right price. Why do you go in? Why do you go and visit a home or an apartment or a townhouse? Why do you have to go and look and see what it looks? Because it matters. Somebody says it didn't matter what the car looks like. I want to let you know it's a good engine. Let's just buy it. You know what questions you ask? What color is it? So let me just go through these categories. Some marriages are struggling because either one of the spouses has quit physically taking care of themselves. You won't get this in the sermon. And this is a very difficult subject to talk about because there's, there is a thing called body shaming. There is a thing about being superficial. There's somebody that's listening to me right now and, and they're not really hearing me. What they're saying is, is that the only thing that matters? No, it's not the only thing that matters. But what we're trying to say is it does matter. <laughs> Why does it matter? Because the story of Leah and Rachel literally starts off with one being tender eyed and the other one being beautiful. That's how the story starts. 
Bef before Jacob comes in the picture, before you know anything about how he feels about anyone, the Bible literally talks about their physical appearance. Matter of fact, when the Bible mentions Saul, the, uh, the one of the things it mentioned about King Saul is how tall he was and how well favored he was physically. Right. Uh, the, the Bible also talks about Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus, when you looked at him, he was not attractive. There was no beauty. The Bible says in Isaiah, there was no beauty that when you looked at Jesus, that you would desire him. And Jesus came that way intentionally. Right. So you can focus on this message. What I'm trying to say uh, and the reason and I would never say that physical uh, maintenance and physical beauty is the most important thing, because uh, if that was the tr if that was true, then you the apostles would not have been saved. People would not have been baptized because if the if physical is the only thing that matters, then then why did Jesus come in the form that he did? His message was amazing. I want to say this. Uh, so so let me say this about um, beauty and sometimes in marriages. Sometimes one of the spouses quits. They don't do their hair. They don't wash their face. When y'all were dating, she used to wear makeup. She doesn't wear makeup anymore. And not that, and she may feel like I don't need to do none of that. And I, but, but just know if you, if you attract a person in one way and then you switch up on them, it could change how they feel. Whether that's right or wrong, if you if you act like this is not a factor, then you could struggle in your your marriage, right? Um, there are some men. Uh, hey, you're you're not 22 anymore, so you're in your 30s or your 40s, and you didn't pick up some weight. And your wife looks at you, and the attraction may not be there. And you want your wife to really desire you, but hey, man, you need to shave. You you, you know you don't smell like. It, it just seemed like you just letting the water run over you. I mean, you need to the, you need to put a little bit more soap. I don't maybe a zest because because zest, zest zest says you can be fully clean. Maybe it's the, it's the wrong bar. So maybe you're not using a washcloth. Okay, so we're gonna get you a, we're gonna get you a new set. We're gonna get you a new set of what because when your wife comes and she smells you and she looks at and you're looking grunted and she's like ah and she's struggling to open up her body to you and it's your wife, but she's she's struggling because it looks like you just let yourself go, right? So physical appearance matters in relationships. Some couples are unhappy. Because they're they're no longer physically attractive to their spouse, uh, and that could be a very difficult thing, because it could be a lot of stuff that happens. This is why f physical appearance matters, but that's but also at the same time you you're going to need God and you're going to need some other things in your marriage, because sometimes life happens, right? Um, she could have got pregnant. Uh, he could have got sick. Um, they could have had some medical issues. I mean, that could be, you know, COVID could have happened. There could have been weight gain. There could have been all a bunch of stuff that could have happened. Uh, he, you know, they could have lost their job or they just were stressing or there was a death of a child or death of a parent or death of a loved one. And, and they ate their feelings and a bunch of stuff that could happen. But I want to let you know that physical appearance matters. Physical appearance matters. So I don't know if you need a new hairstylist. I don't know if you need to sign up to your local gym. You need to start walking every evening. Brother, you need to start doing some push-ups. You need to buy some cologne. You need to do you need to work to maintain the body that belongs to your spouse. The Bible says that when you get married, your body belongs to your spouse. Do your best to maintain it. Give your wife the best version of you. Give your husband the best version of you. Don't don't transform your whole body after the divorce when you could have given that version in your marriage. <laughs> if you would change your mentality now, no life is hard and the bills are coming and you're working two jobs and it's hard to take. But you got to give your spouse the best version of you. And sometimes you have you have such. Uh, hesitancy in marriages that sometimes you have a husband or a wife 
they'll they'll lie and won't tell you the real reason why they're not attracted or they don't want to have sex or they don't want to move forward because they don't want to hurt your feelings because they think that that's just who you are okay well that you know, and and maybe you've had an attitude or maybe you don't care and you keep going to uh tiff treats and 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 the donut shop and you won't stop and they maybe they've tried everything they can to motivate you and, and maybe you're the problem but i want to let you know physicality matters right um the bible says in verse 18 and jacob loved rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Listen, I know what the law says, but I'm willing to break the law. I'll work seven years if I could skip over your older daughter and just get to the younger. I, I, and he loved her. The Bible says he loved her. Now, at, up to this point, we have not read in the text where Rachel has done any backflips, that she's done anything special or miraculous or whatever the case may be. Um... He's looking at Rachel and whatever connection that they have, this man is willing to put in the work. Let me say this. When a man loves you, he won't mind putting in the work. There are some relationships. They are together and y'all get along. And both of you have good communication skills. Both of you are nice to each other. Both of you are Christians and you're kind. But no, there's no spark there. And y'all been dating for about a year. Maybe about a year and a half. And time is going on. It's been about two years. And just, I mean, everything is going well. Y'all both are responsible. Y'all are both on schedule. Y'all both love the Lord. And y'all pray. And y'all read your Bible. And you do all of these things. But... Mm, it's just and sometimes people get married because we're just kind of good together and y'all just you know it's just there i want you to be very careful if, if you're single i want you to be very careful of those type of relationships because at the first sign of any type of trouble because you never had any trouble in your dating so the relationships many times wasn't really tested everything you know everything just kind of went along um it's almost like you're friends. You're, you're, you're not lovers. You're not in love with each other. And if I ask you, hey, how do you feel about him? I love him. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> if you in love, you don't know what I'm talking about. If you in love, you don't know what I'm talking about. But but if you've ever been in a relationship where somebody actually, oh, I, I, I love him. But if they left today, you wouldn't cry. Now, I'm not saying you're wrong for getting married. I'm not saying you shouldn't get married. I'm just saying I need to feel something if you finna leave. I need to clear. I I, I want to I wanna go pursue a fight if you just going to. It should hurt. But I'm, this is what I'm saying. It should hurt. I shouldn't be like, what? Now I'm a dozen. I shouldn't be able to say that. <laughs> I shouldn't be able to say that. Right? Um... The Bible says Jacob loved Rachel. He didn't love Leah. He loved Rachel. And he was willing to put in the work. Sometimes in marriages, you found out that your husband or your wife, they have a love for you, but they were never in love with you. And they weren't willing to wait or they wouldn't even they're not even willing to put in the work you tried to ask her to go to counseling you tried to encourage him to uh talk to the preacher uh y'all tried to go on vacate you you didn't bought va vacation packages and you tried new lingerie and you tried to spice it up and you tried to do little things and put little stuff in and it just and and you're putting in all the effort and they're literally doing nothing and there are some of you, you are thirsty right now. And some of you are hungry for somebody to desire you. And you look up one day and your spouse does not desire you. That can be very painful. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing these out because these ain't the little church. I, I, I don't have any church answers for you. I don't have any, you know, fight on or, you know, just keep pushing. And all those things may be true. 
But your situation is complicated. Y'all don't argue. You may not even fight. But your spouse just don't put in the effort. You come home and the kids are fed, but you don't have nothing to eat. Uh, and, and, and you're not really loved and cared for. That can be very painful. He's willing to work for Rachel. When a man's in love, he'll put that work in. And let me say this on a side note. A man may be in love, but a man shouldn't work if there's abuse. Rachel, as far as we know, is good to him. So his willingness to work seems worth it. Matter of fact, the Bible says in verse 20, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Him working seven days felt like three days for him. He said that was nothing. I'd do it all over again. Some of you have never been in love. You just chose a partner. You just chose a partner. You've never been in love. And so there are some of you, you have been in love, but it was with the wrong person. You fell in love with the wrong person. Or you fell in love with a person that was immature or, or not good for you. And But you know what it feels to be like in love. And so... Sometimes you're unhappy because you chose safe. You married safe. Because you were trying to recover from feeling unsafe in your last relationship. But now you're unhappy because you because you know what it feels like. You're you're missing it. If I'm speaking to that to you, that's something that you have to work out. That's not that's not something that your spouse should be punished for. I think I mentioned this in the previous lesson where you have couples, uh, you have individuals or, or married people who have had all these experience with these other people. And now you're bringing those expectations to your marriage and your current spouse can't match, you know, all of your experiences. And so now you're unhappy because he doesn't know how to do what, you know, uh, Devante did or, you know, Lil D. Lil D used to, and he don't do it like that. So, so sometimes the, the spirit of comparison kills your marriage. It can take the happiness out. The Bible says, um, he said, it felt like but a few days. Verse 21, and Jacob said unto Laban, give me my wife for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her and labor and gather together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her in to him and he went in unto her. So they had the marriage ceremony doing all that, but they waited till the evening time. And in the evening, Laban switched Rachel with Leah. You see how diabolical that is, how evil that is. So Jacob is having a good time looking at his wife across the way. Oh, we finna get married. The evening time goes. He goes into the tent. He get undressed. I'm about to make love. Now notice he has not slept with Rachel. He has not slept with Rachel, so he's ready to, you know, experience this for the first time of how marriage should. This is going to be amazing. The father comes and brings in the tender eyed daughter and takes the beautiful. Ain't that a mess? And the Bible says in verse 25, they had sex. They've consummated the marriage. Verse 25. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this that thou has done unto me? Now, he didn't complain that night. He didn't complain that night. Why am I making that point? They may not complain sexually with you. You can be compatible sexually and not be compatible in the relationship. Some of you, you married him because of what he could do in the bedroom. I mean, but he can't pray for you. She can't, but she don't know God. You picked her 
strictly because she made you feel us, but she don't know God. She don't, she can't quote a scripture to save her life. She thinks that Moses is Jesus's son, and that and that David is Peter's cousin. Ah, she's mixing all the stuff. She don't know God. She'll go to worship with you. But that's not why you married her. You married her because she was kind of a little worldly and she didn't mind going to worship with you. Or he said, hey, listen, you know, I, I love God too. And that's that was the last, that was the last spiritual conversation that y'all had. You asked him, do you love God? He said, yeah, I love God. You didn't ask him what, what congregation he was part of. You didn't ask him, did he obey the gospel? You didn't you didn't even know if he was converted or saved. And so be, you can you can make a marriage decision based upon what some what somebody could do for you sexually. And so there are many of you, you, you've had sex before marriage and it was so amazing that you, matter of fact, on the wedding day, you said, I do, but not to a, not to the person really in front of you, but to their abilities. He did not complain that night. He didn't really look at her. He didn't really see her. He was so into what he was doing and he had no complaint. But when he woke up in the morning and he had to look at her. That's why I say don't ever say that be, uh, uh, looks don't matter. It matters. Now, beauty is in the eye of a beholder. So, you know, the standard is different from one person to the other. You just need to make sure that when you look at your spouse, you say, that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. If you look at your spouse, and I'm not talking to married people, so I'm talking to those who are single. If you look at your spouse and you say, That right there, that, let me get back to the text. That right there. Yeah, anyway. The Bible says, he, uh, it came to pass in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this that thou hast done to me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel, wherefore thou hast tricked me or beguiled me and Laban said it must be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn fulfill her week and we will give this also for the service which thou hast served with me yet seven other years Laban said the father said hey listen I, I'll give you two for I, I just need to get my older daughter married didn't look like didn't look like Leah was finna get married so I just I had to do something to help her out because she was going to end up staying with me forever um I want to say this. You can trick somebody into marriage. You can try to act like you're you're going to be everything that they need and you can play that role. The problem is, is when you say I do, you settle back down into who you really are. And you know you tricked him. You found out what he liked and you did all the stuff that he liked. And he thought that this was what I'm going to get. Only to realize that that wasn't really you. And man, you deceived her. There's a lot of men that's out there. You you are de you are decef uh, deceitful. And the reason why I say you're deceitful is because uh, she didn't know that you took a loan out so that you could take her uh, to a five star restaurant. And all those trips that she was taking was on your grandmother's credit card, bonus, bonus uh, flights, uh, points. And those were not, that's not something that you paid for. You had her believing that y'all were going to go on vacation every other month. But you, that's not your lifestyle. Girl, you had him believing that you could cook. And you can't boil water. You over there Uber eating uh, uh, and and having deliveries and just changing the box and had him really believing like, baby, you really you really put your foot in this gravy and you lying. You don't really look like that. That's not that's you and and you're not that spiritual. 
you would skip worship services. You might go to, you know, worship service maybe once or twice a month. But then when you got with that man, all of a sudden you go into all the worship services plus Bible class. You doing stuff you ain't never done before. And he's thinking he's getting a godly woman or, or she's thinking I got this godly man because he's always at worship with me. and he, We read in the Bible and that ain't even you. I want to let you know, just like Jacob, you can wake up in the morning. See, this is a story where the, where. In this marriage, the man and the wife are not happy. He, Jacob is not happy because he was deceived. This, you knew what I wanted, and and I didn't get what I wanted. So he got deceived on his wedding day. How many of you said I do? And almost literally 24 hours after you said I do, you found out, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> Because the person took their mask off and really started to be who they who they are. You found out on the honeymoon or you found out five, four or five, six months into the marriage that none of the stuff that the person that you was with was telling you the truth or they were telling you partial truths. Right. So. Don't ever think that you can deceive somebody. Because that person looks so good to you and you feel like y'all will be such a great couple together that. It'll turn into resentment. Do you know that there are, I'm, I'm doing men and women. Do you know that there are a lot of men? That woman was beautiful to him. He did everything he could to get her. The problem is, and it can happen with women too. You see, you see this man, he is all, he checks everything you, I mean, if you could just have him, you would be content. Here's where people get mean in their marriage. You got, a, you got a lot of mean husbands and you got a lot of mean wives. And one of the reasons why they're mean is because I did what I did to get you. The problem is I don't have what I need to keep you. One of the most painful things is to look at your spouse and know that you don't make them happy. And that could be a partial, it could be on them, but there are some circumstances you deceived them. You hounded them. You were all in their face. You didn't give them any air. You pressured them into marriage. Matter of fact, you, you, you push sex on them to get them to commit to you and be with you. And, and any man or any woman that got close to your man or your woman, you made sure to sabotage it, run them away. You made sure that nothing that that person... Uh, <laughs> Any other interest or any other possibility, you tried to poison his whole world where he could only see you. Now, you got him. She's yours. She bad. Oh, she's beautiful. She does it for you. The problem is she woke up in the morning and found out you don't do it for her. Or you don't do it for him. And it's a painful thing to look at your husband and realize I did a lot to get him, but as he, I know he's looking at me, I'm not what he wants. See, we don't talk about this stuff in the church. Now you're married and both of you are going to honor your vow, but that sadness just hit you because you use deception. What advice would you give Leah? Preachers, elders, what advice would you give Leah? And let me say this about that. You got a lot of preachers. They're married. They're not in love. You got a lot of elders and, and deacons. They're all married. And sometimes you'll be in worship service and you'll be envying a relationship, not even realizing they could just be holding on because of the vow and the love for God. But there's no love between them. Be very careful about desiring to be like other couples. If you was to look at uh, Jacob and Leah walking down the street, you would say, oh, they're married. I want I want a relationship like that. Leah would turn around to you and say, no, nah, I, I tricked him to be with me. And he never loved me. We've been together. We've been together romantically. But no matter how good you are in the bedroom, you can't. That's not a way to get somebody's heart. You can get their attention, but you can't manipulate somebody's heart. If a person doesn't love you, they just don't love you.
and you're forcing you're forcing the relationship you're trying to make your husband and you're trying to make your wife and you can't and there ain't no cute church answer for that you bought all the, all the lingerie you 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 take all the spin classes you you took up swimming you try to find out what their hobbies you try to be supportive and sometimes you're grieving because you're in a Leo situation. He never wanted you. She did not want you. The man that she really wanted chose somebody else and so you was a second option. You were safe. You got a good job and you had benefits. So she said, okay. But she wasn't in love with you. The Bible says, um, I, w I want us to skip down to um, verse 30. And he went in also unto Rachel and he loved also Rachel more than Leah and served with him yet seven other years can you imagine your husband getting up every morning to go work for another woman that's what Leah is dealing with and Leah is honoring her marriage she is but she is married to a man that does not love her and she married a man knowing Notice she's not a victim Leia is not a victim Now she is She will be a victim On how she is treated But She has A fault to play In this as well In knowing I know he didn't love me But I wanted to be married So badly That I was willing To work on the love later Whatever you're okay with in the dating, don't don't assume that it's going to change when you say I do. Weddings do, do not make people love you. Wedding should be a reflection of what's already there. A, a wedding doesn't bring in love. If I can just get you to the altar, I know you'll love me. That's the, the, Weddings don't do that and marriage does not do that. Marriage does not do that. So she's married, but he never loved her. He always loved Rachel. Always loved Rachel. Always loved Rachel. Right? I want you to be very careful about marrying people who... This is for my singles. I want you to be very careful about marrying people who they still talk highly and in love with their ex. Because you'll always be a second option. You'll be sitting down with your girlfriend or your boyfriend consoling them about somebody who's no longer present. You got to let that go. Now, you got to learn about a person's past. But what we're not going to do is is be emotional and fantasize over. I was so good to her. Oh, I was so good. I was so good to her. She was so loved. Oh, she, she had the little lavender. I just, and, and, and she over there like, uh, you want me to call her? Oh, the way, oh, the, and then when she and when she laughed, her her shoulders would giggle and and jiggle, and I just oh, I miss her so much. Anyway, you ready to go out on a date? Nah, I think you still grieving. The way you talking about, I think you need to go deal with that, All right? Jacob never was, was not gonna get over Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel. He loved her. That wasn't going away. And a wedding doesn't make love go away. I want to say that again. Weddings don't make love go away. And I know you look at the clock because it's time to get married. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. It don't make love. Weddings don't make love. It reveals it. It does not bring it. You have some couples like, I'm going to make this, I'm going to try to make this work. That's how you went into your marriage. Okay, I know I see this and I see that and I see that and I see all these flags, but I'm going to make this work. Okay, there's no guarantee that it'll come. Sometimes you're unhappy because you put your best foot forward and it didn't give you that love and feeling that you was looking for or waiting for. You have to own up to the part that you play. That matter of fact, if, if you don't get anything, what I'm saying from this lesson is Leia has to own up for what she did and then and and realize, oh, wait a minute, maybe I've caused this. Right? Now, she doesn't deserve to be abused or mistreated, but um, this was set in motion 
because she said she said I do to somebody knowing full well that his heart was somewhere else. The Bible says, verse 31, and when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, now all of a sudden she's starting to get mistreated in a relationship. Some of you are unhappy because you have a mean spouse, an unloving, an unforgiving spouse. You didn't realize that you married an unforgiving spouse. And let me say, let me say this. Um, In order to be married a long time, both of you are going to have to learn to forgive. If you don't go into marriage with the ability to forgive, you won't be married long. So some of you are unhappy because offenses will come. The problem is you've done everything you could or maybe within your toolbox to ask for forgiveness and repair it. But you have a spouse that's incapable of not only forgiving, but they keep records. They keep throwing old stuff back in your face and you can't win like that. That's why you're unhappy. Your spouse doesn't know how to forgive. They, but they, they said they forgive. Yeah, just because they said it doesn't mean they know how to do it. <laughs> just because they said, I forgive you, doesn't mean that they really know how to do it. And, and sometimes they have not healed from it. So she's in this relationship and she's being mistreated in this relationship. And she's knowing that her husband's love is not with her. That's a very difficult place to be married in a loveless place. All right? The Bible says in verse 32, um, I mean, in verse 31, but God opened up her womb. So because of her married con situation God can decide to open and close a womb um, why God did that and his understanding for that uh, is, is many times beyond ours and so sometimes you're in a marriage and you're hurting and you may even be being mistreated uh, and at the same time, you're honoring your vow. This is not an easy conversation. I can tell you, God sees what happens in marriages. If you get any consolation for what I'm saying, God is not oblivious about what happens in marriage. He knows what he said to you. God knows how your husband treated you and set you up, manipulated you. He knows the things that was done in private and in secret that nobody else in the world knows. Brother, I want to let you know that God sees what's happening in your marriage. He sees that you're trying and you've been trying to get up and go to worship and she's intentionally making you late or she uh, comes up with excuses of why not to do certain things for you. And I know it hurt because she forgot your birthday. And she didn't put any effort in toward the anniversary and you bought flowers and you did all and she put no effort in. She gives other people more attention than you. God sees what happens in marriages. He sees, but also at the same time, God is watching to see if you're going to be faithful to him. In the church, uh, and maybe even in the world, infidelity is a big thing in marriages. What's not discussed is there are there are a hundred roads to infidelity and infidelity will always be sinful. It will always be wrong, no matter what road you take. I want to say that I don't care what road you take to infidelity. Once you get there, you have to repent. But what is not discussed and why God doesn't doesn't judge infidelity all the same is because there are a hundred roads to get there. What do I mean by that? Some of you are in marriages. Your spouse doesn't touch you. Matter of fact, you can't even remember the last time you got aroused or touched. And this could be very difficult. And that's the breeding ground for infidelity. That's the breeding ground for adultery. Now, if you commit adultery, the church is going to speak up and say, how could you do that? Why did you do that? Why did you make your break your vow? What nobody knows is you wasn't touched. And then you went to work and your co-worker came up from behind and said, hey, you OK? 
it was the beginning of the end from that side and it was just a side hug but but when he walked up and gave that side hug you was like i ain't got enough strength for this so you went home and you tried to tell your husband, listen, I really need us to work on and your husband ignored you that day or he went out hung out with the boys and you said, I'm in a dangerous place and I don't know what to do. I want to let you also know your pain does not justify your sin. So even though it hurts and even though you've been ignored and you've been begged, some of you feel like, well, shoot, I'm going to do whatever I want to do because he doesn't care. You still got to answer to God hear me you still have to answer for god for everything that you do even the 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 home of infidelity is illegal but there are a hundred roads that lead there if you understand my voice and you're hearing me right now and you find you and you believe that you're on one of those roads i want to encourage you to get off that road as painful as much as you cry and it feels good when somebody gives you attention it feels good when somebody speaks life to you and says good morning to you matter of fact there are some of you you probably would feel like my husband or my wife wouldn't even care if i cheated and that might be rightfully so but god does care you got some spouses they can they can be gone for two and three days and their spouse wouldn't care they they feel abandoned but I still want to let you know the house of infidelity is always sinful. But there are a hundred roads that lead there. God doesn't judge all infidelity the same. And my heart goes out to many of you that you haven't got a hug, a kiss. You haven't you haven't been cared for. You, you've been you, you've had the silent treatment put on you. Y'all don't even speak. And you're vulnerable right now. My prayers are with you. That could be that's extremely difficult. And we gotta stop acting in the church like that's an easy fix. That's not an easy fix. And and for many of you, you are fighting the good fight. And I commend you. Because you could be out in those streets, but you go home. You don't give out your number, you you get off of social media. You are trying the best that you're not perfect, but you're trying the best. I commend you. Trying the best that you can. Okay. Uh, if you got tears in your eyes right now, it's because it hurts. It hurts. That the the marriage that you got, you thought that they were going to give a hundred like you did. And maybe you didn't even give 100. Maybe you gave 80, but you found out they were just giving 15. <laughs> and you said, I'm not perfect, but my goodness, this, it could be so much better than this. And it could be a lot of marriages could be better if two people would just put in the effort. I also want to say this. Um, and matter of fact, I'll say this after this, this point. The Bible says in verse 32, Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, surely the Lord have looked upon my uh, affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. She had her first son believing that after I have this child, he'll love me. I want to let you know, brothers, you can buy the biggest bag, bracelet. You can, you can try to give all the gifts in the world that will never make a woman love you. It'll make her connect, be connected to you. You can have her for the day. But you got to, well, here's the thing is you, you're going to have to keep doing that to keep her. And one day you're going to want love and she won't have it to give because the relationship is based upon transaction. It's a transactional relationship. It's not based on love. She had a first son and she called her first son Reuben, which means to look. Look, she's trying to get her husband's attention. And she says, once he sees this, I know he'll love me. The Bible says in verse 33, and she conceived again and bare a son. And because the Lord had heard that I was hated, he had therefore given me this son. And she called his name Simeon, which means listen. Jacob is not looking at her and Jacob is not listening to her. And so she's naming her children based upon her neglect. Simeon means to look. I mean, to to hear. Simeon means to hear. She's hurting. <laughs> She's hurting. 
The Bible says in verse 34, she conceived again and bare a son. And now this time will my husband be joined unto me. He wasn't looking at me. He wasn't listening to me. And he was far away. When I have this third child, which is Levi, I have borne him three sons. Therefore, she called him Levi. He, he will now be with me and he won't be over there. In a loving relationship, when it's when it's really supposed to be, I don't have to manipulate you, and I don't have to. And I, I want to say this: there's a lot of laziness in marriage. So you have a lot of lazy men, and you have a lot of lazy women that feel like they don't have to do anything, but you supposed to just love me and be and want to be here, even though I don't put in any effort. That's ungodly. And for a lot of people who are lazy, you're killing your own marriage and you, you're probably playing the blame game. You know, oh, I know I didn't do all, but, you know, it shouldn't matter. It does matter. Your effort matters. The little raggedy balloon and little tie that you gave him. How you gonna come? That's 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 laziness. You got him a cake that he didn't even want. You gave her a hug and some roses and told her happy anniversary, and then went and sat on the couch and watched it, watched the game. You're lazy. And so the reason why the devil is so good at attacking marriages is because a lot of marriages failed because somebody outside of the marriage just put in some effort. If that's your wife, nobody should put more effort into your wife than you. If that's your husband, you don't let no uh, you don't you don't let no other woman fix him a plate or or, or or take care of him and tend to him and ask him if he need anything. And and you over there sitting next to him saying, "Well, uh, Tell her to tell her to tell her to bring two plates. What? That's your husband. That's your wife. You got other men opening the door for her and to, and asking her, do you and putting gas on her tank? That's your wife. Well, I'm kind of down, man. You get you better get up and do whatever. So there's a lack of effort. You got to get up and do what you're supposed to do. And, the, and, and, and there are a lot of women and men who are in marriages and you don't think your husband and wife can be taken. They can be taken. I want you to hear me. I know you I know you putting up your ring and you want them to see I'm, I'm married. You can have the person physically, but their heart can be across the, 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 uh, the office. All because somebody put in more effort. Well, nobody should be able to, you shouldn't be looking anywhere. That's true. But at the same time, when you neglect what you have, hear me what I'm saying. There are a hundred roads that lead to the house of infidelity. Laziness is one of those roads. Neglect is another one of those roads. All right. She's having all these children because she's thinking, I'm going to get this love. And, and so she's trying to transaction, uh, 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 get a transaction from Jacob. I give you this and you give me. And it doesn't work that way. Marriage doesn't, a, a good marriage doesn't work on transaction. Now, you can be married for a long time. That doesn't mean you have a good marriage. And that doesn't mean that love is in your marriage. You can be in prison for a long time, but I don't want to be in prison. I've been married for 45 years. So what? Are you happy? If you ain't happy or if if if, if you don't feel blessed or y'all not working on the relationship, why are you bragging about how long? Talk to me about the quality of the marriage. Don't talk to me about how long y'all been. Don't don't lead with that. Don't lead with how long you've been married, because being married a long time could just just means that both of y'all are skilled in in coping. I don't want to know how long I want to know the quality. No matter what she did, he didn't love her. No matter what she did, he didn't love her. She's in a marriage where she's realizing there's nothing I can do to get him to want me. Because I tricked him in the first place. The Bible says in verse 35, and she conceived again. Now she's on her fourth child. She conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. Toward the end, Leah said, 
I need to run and focus on God. I need to give God the praise. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his right, and all these things will be added. Sometimes you you didn't get marriage counseling. Y'all just jumped in and got into marriage, and then you try to do counseling later. You got married because of the sex before the marriage. And then you try to invite God into the, the marriage later. God never showed up. And now you're grieving because maybe you've repented and you are now in your word and you're growing. And this ungodly relationship that God started. Now you're trying to turn it over into be spiritual and you're grieving because you don't you can't do it. You could be unhappy because you want God and your spouse doesn't. So now you feel spiritually alone. He's physically there. She's physically there, but you're spiritually alone. Because you're the only one striving to get your soul right with God. And you're the only one in your house that's trying to do it. I want to let y'all know there's a lot of conversations about marrying outside of the church. Before you marry outside of the church, go talk to somebody who is. Who would be honest with you about the weight that they carry. That ain't a weight that you want to sign up for. Now, if you're a great evangelist, you say, well, I'm going to get married and convert them. Okay, well, then, you know, you could be the great evangelist of the 21st century. But if you don't got them evangelism skills, and I would encourage you not to marry somebody so you can convert them. That's deceptive, too. Sometimes your spouse is rejecting you because the whole time y'all was dating, you never talked about God. All of a sudden... Right before it's time to get married, you had all these stipulations that they got to get baptized and they got to do. And you're unhappy. But what you don't realize is you were deceptive. You should have talked about God on the first, second or third date and how important God was to you. You didn't went to the club with him. Y'all done drank and got high and y'all done did everything under the sun. And now that it's time to get married. You said, well, you know, we need to get married at, at the Church of Christ. And, and you know, I, I don't I don't participate and we want to raise our children. And now when children are in the picture, now you want to raise them up in a godly. You you did the switcheroo. So you go around and you tell everybody about your marriage, about, you know, my spouse is not in Christ, but your spouse is at home angry saying you should have said this at the beginning. We did stuff together <laughs> and then all of a sudden you you just stopped cold turkey and now you don't smoke no more. And you don't drink no more and you don't you don't go to the club no more and your husband ready to say you ready to go out. You said, no, nah, I don't want to go there no more. He like, why not? He felt like you changed and maybe you did, but maybe you wasn't honest either. So now you now you say, OK, now what do I do? One of the difficult things about marriage is you can't manipulate people and you can't make people be something that they never wanted to be. And that was Leia's situation. I'm not going to make this man love me because I'm not his person. I'm not his person. Some of you get so infatuated with a person, you try to make that person your person. That's not your person. Why won't he love me? Wrong question to ask. Because real love is not forced. Now, I know there are circumstances and situations that make sometimes relationships are complicated. Some You got to consider the season. Sometimes it's the wrong season or sometimes other stuff is involved. Sometimes people are fresh out of a heartbreak or whatever the case may be. They just need time to heal. That doesn't mean that you're not their person. It's just they're trying to detox from whatever they were in. And those are all those scenarios. But you should never try to force it. You shouldn't force anything. If you have to force it, it's probably not yours. She had to turn to God at the end. I encourage you to turn to God. This is for marriages with, with not simple answers. This isn't about put the toilet seat down and y'all need to hug each other. Y'all need to do this more. You know, there are couples. If y'all go to those workshops and conferences, it'll work for you. But for there's a group out there. Um... Where marriage counseling is not an option. You've read every book about relationships. You've you've tried to do everything you could, and yeah, it's hard. Somebody said, "Brother, we don't end the Bible class like this." 
no, nah, if I don't end it like this, then we not being real. And the people who are living in those situations saying, yeah, those are real cute answers with a little bow on them, but that ain't my situation. This Bible class is for you. This is your situation. You are, you are at a Genesis 29 verse 35 situation where you just got to turn to God because you cannot make anybody in your home change. He, he is not coming to worship with you. She does not want your God. She not trying to she not trying to tend to you. She's not that type of wife. You wanted a southern belle and you got a western jackal. Ain't no bells in your house. And one of the struggles that you're going to have is social media is so dangerous. You'll start to see what you really want and then look up and realize you don't have it. And that'll be a part of your unhappiness. Now, I want to say this, too, before I close. Sometimes you're unhappy because you have unrealistic expectations. Sometimes you're unhappy because because you are pursuing f earthly and fleshly things. Sometimes you're unhappy because you're not spiritual and you don't forgive. It's not always everybody else's fault. Look yourself in the mirror. What she did in verse 35, she had to look at herself and God and say, okay, God, I got to get right with you. I'm going to get focused on you. Sometimes when you focus on God, it frees up God to focus on your spouse. If your spouse is rotten and you're going to go around and be right rotten with them. Two wrongs don't make a right. That's what Eddie said. Eddie, Eddie Kane said two wrongs don't make a right. So just just because they went rotten, you can't go be rotten right after them. Maybe this is the season where you just got to focus on God. Well, what about them? You can't focus on them right now. You got to focus on you and God. Thank you for tuning in. I want you to hit that like button, hit that share button. Let's get this message out. I want to hear from you. I want to hear about how you feel. Uh, some of you are in this situation. Uh, and I definitely pray that this was a blessing. This is a marriage that uh, is very difficult to read in the scriptures. But it's real. I love the Bible because it's real. And sometimes you're in very difficult situations. I want you to keep praying. We're praying for you. Don't let go and don't quit. God sees everything. And I want to say this. God not only sees, he has a plan. The plan may feel like it's taking a long time, but don't quit on God. We also, uh, we want you to hit that like button, hit that share button. Let's, let's get that out. Also, uh, for those of you who give to this message, please hit that link below uh, and we'll receive your love offering. Thank you. Uh, for those who tune in every week, we want you to partner with us and let's keep this platform going. If this is a blessing, uh, if this if this is a blessing, support it. Don't just hit the like, don't hit the share, uh, but give your love offering, give your donation. Um, and we'll, we'll be definitely appreciative uh, of your support. I want to let you know something. We are here to heal, help and restore. Be blessed.